th this button. I've pressed that button, which means that we are, well, we're not live, but we're live, but we're sort of live. Hello, everyone. Hello, hello, hello. Um, This is a pre-record. Wait a minute. I need to have a better pre-record. This is a pre-record. Um, yeah, and for once, I'm not going to be in the chat because I'm going to be in deepest, darkest North Devon with no, literally no way of accessing the internet, um, which is nice. Uh, so I'm having a holiday. Uh, and to join me on my holiday, in a sense, uh, is is Steve Steve Wood. Steve Wood is here. Um, hello, Steve. Hi. Hiya. Hi. I'm going to press. I'm going to press this button here. Look, it's Steve hey, Wood. Everyone, me, like, look, he's over here. He's over here. I've worn my um, best uh, Amtrak shirt just for the occasion. Very, uh, thanks. It's, it's very nice. <laughs> I have an incredibly boring Tesco blue T-shirt that I panic bought uh, because I knew I needed something fresher for continuity purposes <laughs> for real life, which was t three weeks ago in everyone who's listening's time and two weeks ago for anyway. This is not very interesting, but um, Steve, thanks so much for joining us. We we it's um yeah a long time follower of the show. I'm very pleased to say it's uh, yeah thanks yeah yeah it's, um, a nice thing, nice to be a contribute for once rather than just being in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> it's um yeah this is a really interesting stuff. so so what's in, what's double interesting is that this okay it's not happened yet uh, on Wednesday night for, for us in our time time <laughs> continuity but in the in everyone else's time continuity last week was another signaling episode so. Um, there's this kind of this is this is a bit of it. I mean, this sort of is a signaling episode, really. But actually, it's a bit bigger than that. We'll, we'll get there. But yeah, we are we are here to talk about. Uh, let's let's go. Oh, actually, Steve, before I yammer on, before I say what we're going <laughs> to to talk about, Steve, tell us what you do. Uh, right, so I, my name is Steve Wood. I am a signaling design engineer. Uh, so what my job is is basically I uh, I specialize in layout uh, design in signaling. So in, in the railway terms, I do sort of concept designs. I, I look at uh, uh, existing layouts and uh, potentially uh, unbuilt layouts, and I, I, I remodel them in a, the Siglin and to basically provide the most efficiency, the best layout for the customer, and also uh, the, the, the sort of general uh, approval process of that. So that's that's me. Oh, nice. Okay. So, um, and the reason why this is relevant for tonight's episode is because if I go back to this button here, we're going to be talking. It is episode sixty-nine. Nice, and um, we're going to be nice. talking about how, yeah, nice, nice. And um, we're going to be talking about how to make trains go faster, which um, which is a topic a lot of people have actually been requesting on the Discord server. Um, thank you, Patreon people, for your suggestions. So how so so that's why Steve is here to talk about how to make trains go faster. Fun enough, the answer is not. It is not to uh to to build Hyperloop. Um, and we will be exploring why this isn't the answer um, in the next in the next hour or so. Um, so, uh, without further ado, let's uh, let's uh, let's start the show. With that, with that, it, it's it's happening. It's another pre-recorded episode. Thanks all of you for joining us. Uh, welcome to tonight's Rail Matter. <laughs> City 225, and it's going to now fade away. There we are. That got you, bingo, people. I, I've reworded my normal thing I say at this point. Um, strangely enough, let's uh, let's let's jump to Jerry. Uh, strangely enough, the uh, the I've the engine didn't sound that time, so I'm going to have to overlay that in post production. This is the advantage of pre-records, right? Anyway, so um, uh, Jerry Halliwell is why is Jerry Halliwell on my screen, Steve? What's happened? Why it's, it's Jerry Halliwell? Tell us about going faster. It's... Well, she, 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 she's simply asking, scream if you want to go faster. And I think the real question we all asked is, I need to ask Jerry is, do you really want to go faster, Jerry? Are you sure that's what you want to do? <laughs> 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 because, I mean, currently she's clinging on to the back of what appears to be a Cadillac. And I suspect that's quite dangerous for those roller skate wheels. But in yep. railway terms, the, the same uh, principles apply. Um, when we talk about going faster, do we what do we really mean? And 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 is it just a case of just like let the driver go quicker or is or what are the impacts of that and i think that's kind of um what what we what we really mean here so i guess the question i guess uh to to you gareth perhaps put it back to you like this let's do it this way um how do we go faster well yeah how do we go well i mean the first thing is i mean obviously there is the there's the track question 
which is that you there's only so fast you can that like we can provide as permanent way engineers we can make you go a certain speed we can give you an allowable maximum speed a v max as some might call it but that's not that the railway is more complicated than that um i suppose likewise as, as a, coming from a signaling background you can achieve certain speeds but again the railway is more complicated than that right yeah and so my, my kind of my premise to this is that you can achieve um, speed increases through through lots of lots of different ways and and so the example that i've got sort of uh, pre uh, sort of preempted here in, in many ways is off the back of the the recent record attempt now if you yeah. want to get from glasgow to london um or london to glasgow depending on which way you go which is where i live um you can do that in about four and a half to five hours uh, on a on a normal service train but if you simply just don't stop anywhere uh you 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 know as per the recent record attempts you three hours 52 minutes yeah saved you to you know depended on the, the time anywhere between uh 40 minutes and and, and uh, an hour plus nearly uh, mm, yeah 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 for, for, from just simply not stopping but is that actually what people want <laughs> is like, that uh, useful for all those I mean, people who don't live in london or glasgow yeah i mean if you're if you're if it's the the european football championships and you're traveling down to you know support the tartan army perhaps it is what you want but for the average punter who you know lives in birmingham or preston or manchester or, or any of the places in between this is of no use to them um and and when we talk about uh journey time reduction and remember that we need to um remember that the, the going faster isn't always the right solution um and uh that's kind of preempted my uh i guess your next slide which i know is is i i, I used to always refer to it as the big gong uh, of, <laughs> uh of railway systems engineering uh you yeah, need this, to remember this is and the, hit it. <laughs> the gong which is the railway is a system oh and I, I think for, for for me and i guess for you uh, uh, you working in in a project sort of environment um we're quite used to um working as, as a team so um, myself i'm a signal engineer yourself as a track engineer we would work as part of a team of engineers you'd be, be us and there'd be an oli guy and, and, a, and a and a civil engineer and all these people that you need to to get this to, to work but when you, when you work, don't work in the rail industry it perhaps is less obvious and yeah, a yeah. speed limit is more like a car um, yeah, <laughs> just you just be, you, you, pu you push the go button and you make the faster <laughs> happen. But but the reality is, that, yeah, it's somewhat more complex on the railway. Yeah, and for 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 me as a, as a signaling engineer, there are there are lots of concerns. Um, but when we consider our own concerns, like for yourself as a as a as a, as a P way man, you might look at the the railway and go, "Well, there's no reason why you can't go faster here," and uh, that is the most dangerous uh, words to leave anyone's mouth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, in so much as that, uh, if it, just because you, it's okay for you doesn't mean it's okay for everyone else. And so I think when we talk about the railway and going faster, we need to understand those those systems engineering implications of what we're, what we're doing. And this is something that that really interests me. Um, from my own project background and, and sort of systems engineer as a whole when it comes to the railway um yeah I must so, say sis, sorry no no i was gonna say yeah exactly i just thought i'd throw up some visual stimuli <laughs> for our for our um natter guests to uh, our natter viewers to um to sort of yeah to kind of prompt the idea of that so yeah there's loads of stuff on here um so from your perspective go 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 through pop through a few of these and i might chip in with my own thoughts as well yeah uh, i guess um We'll talk about signaling separately, but I mean, looking on here, so for, if you've got a, a beautiful viaduct at the top left there, um, which, I mean, fine, yeah, I'm sure it, it may be able to support high speeds, but can it? What's the dynamic loading on on that, uh, that structure? How is that impacted by the higher speeds? And as trains go faster, you know, more weight impacts on the on on that uh, on that civil engineering. And I'm getting well off of my own uh, my own wheelhouse here, but I'll, <laughs> I'll let the civil engineers talk about it's this. It's true. What thing. you're saying is true. It's true. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and actually, and, and it actually applies. Um, and you might well, I might well be about to shoot one of your foxes here, but it applies <laughs> for track in a loading sense as well. Well, is it not just in terms of alignment but track bed is something that um you know the, the track bed has to sustain those speeds you know um and speeds uh, directly relate to what what from a track perspective what track category we choose which in turn informs our materials and also informs things like spaces between certain track features and the way that we come on and off bridges so so yeah so so speed isn't just about the alignment as well from a track perspective let alone uh kind of for track structure perspective if you like um, let alone a civil structures, you know, a major structures perspective. 
yeah, and, and and as you kind of uh, butters up against there uh, for the, the middle, um, the, the middle picture there, the the the, 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 the gang of the gang of folks with uh, with shovels, spades, and and and, and equipment. Uh, as you go up those track categories, that increases your maintenance load in, that increases your wear and tear, um, particularly depending on on the, how that alignment is arranged. What what was a perfect alignment that you know minimised wear and tear. Is now suddenly one that, that wears out a lot quicker because the the loading on it is 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 much more significant. Yeah. Um, and do you have and do you have stabling for a tamper that can get easy access? You know these yeah, sorts of things like okay, if you're access, yeah. doing doing your line speed. Okay, we're gonna have a we're gonna increase the line speed of this line. Right. Well, okay, you need a new maintenance depot. Where's that going? Because you need to have more frequent access, which means you need to reduce the time to site for tamping kit. X Y Z. You know all these things cascade through. Uh, yeah. It's a it's a, it's it's a complicated thing, and, and and even out with the sort of um, the the sort of infrastructure parts that that I, I normally specialize in, um, the, things like the timetable and the rolling stock, uh, sort of beautifully indicated there by I think the Midland Railway timetable. Yeah, that's the, nice. <laughs> the, uh, the 19th century. Um, you, if you increase the, the the speed on a piece of line, and then it, the train reaches somewhere where it can't find a path or um, there is another sort of impediment to, um, to, to passing. Uh, the example I would use is um, something like the Highland Main Line or the Aberdeen to Inverness lines here in Scotland, uh, some routes down in Cornwall, particularly the single line sections. If the train arrives at the passing loop early, but the train coming from the other direction that it has to cross with can't meet the same time demand, all you do is sit in the loop for five minutes extra. Yeah. So your time saving is completely null and void. Um, so when we talk about the railway as a system, you have to include the operational impacts of that. And so uh, another good example there, there's a, a beautiful score. I think there's a 380 uh, in the center there. 385, oh, yeah, uh, it's the new one. Shiny. The new one. Uh, uh, the, the, the rolling stock is capable of a certain speed and, and um, some rolling stock is more capable than other rolling stock. Um, <laughs> Uh, so a, a good example for that would be um, uh, the the one five eights on the West Highland line that have been added to the one seventies. I think that's right. I'm not a, not a train guy, I must say, but um, the, the, certainly the, the the I think the one seventies can do ninety miles an hour, whereas the one five eights can only do sixty. So therefore, if you attach one onto the back, you're slowing the train down. Um, I so do, has yeah, a, I think they can do. Yeah. I think the one seventies can do. I think it is. A, they're both a little fast. I think the one seventies can hit. A hundred, but the one eight one five eights can only hit yeah. ninety. I think it, that I it's think something along something those like lines, that, and yeah. and that small nuance, that co that small consequence of that action, suddenly changes the how the whole timetable works, and um, increasing the line speed for a train that simply can't do it. So for um, a lot of trains on the network, going above a hundred is just not possible. Mm. Um, so uh, what are we grasping at, and what are we trying to achieve when we talk about the the railway system as a whole? Yeah, um, and, and, and yeah. So from an operational perspective, the kind of the age old thing that a lot of people come back with. Well, you know, as an HS two retort, it's oh, you know, you can achieve these things with little tweaks on the existing network. You can achieve <laughs> the same thing. It's like, yeah, but the point is by increasing those. So for example, that the the the, the Avanti record, you know, the the Royal Scott attempt. Um, if you wanted to achieve that regularly, you would totally eviscerate rail capacity because you'd have to run far fewer trains a day. You'd not be able to run any locals or regional services. It comes back to the old um, advanced passenger train episode, the, the the what if episode, way back in rail natter ancient history, where we said, well, actually, the, if APT had succeeded, we might have seen more local stations closing. And actually, yes, yeah, so speed on an existing network is has potentially serious con negative consequences for the the functionality of that of that it, railway, it, particularly it, for a mixed traffic rail with with local absolutely freight yeah. services on it. And I know you make this point all the time regarding HS2, and I think it can't, cannot be reiterated enough. By, by moving the fast services off of the West Coast Main Line, you release capacity. And, and that, that, I mean, you can just please, can you get it on a t shirt? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, HS2 is a West Coast Main Line bypass. It's like, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. For, for those that can't follow, it, it's. Uh, and, it, and Middle Main Line and East Coast uh, and, Main Line. Yes, as I and, point and, out. The, yeah. and the other two as well. Yeah. So it, 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 the, the, the way that simply making these trains go faster all you do is catch the slow trains up quicker yeah, yeah. um so uh, for, for your freight train this is no good so what do you do do you get rid of the freight train or do you simply put them onto a new line and i think we've, we've probably done that to death uh, yeah. the, um, the hs2 arguments yeah we, we indeed so indeed so right so 
Here are two other pictures we're not talking about. One about track, which we have already covered quite a lot, probably. Uh, so just in case you had anything else you wanted to say, like, I don't know, there's drainage in there, drainage, all sort of thing. But yeah. also OLE. So, uh, yeah, any, anything on the on on, uh, on either of those that you wanted to point out? So, so um, overhead lines is a classic. And again, uh, not not my, my area of speciality, but it particularly um, overhead line is, is graded. And uh, particularly, so you, you can see there that the overhead line sort of wiggles left to right, but actually it also goes up and down. Um, and there's a, as with track, uh, a relationship between uh, the the amount that, that that wire can increase its height from the top of the train and and, and below it again. So a classic example is a, is a level crossing. The overhead line raises up to go over the, the level crossing, um, so there's more clearance for things underneath it. And similarly, it might squeeze down underneath a bridge. And there's a there's a graze associated with that, which is associated with speed and a maximum amount that you can do that. And it's and quite so strict as, yeah. actually. It's oh, quite, it's very strict. It's quite yeah. a challenge. It's it's a serious. Concern constraint on any sort of work like this i learned this fairly early on in doing some of this work it's incredibly strict and challenging to to, to manage that fair play to the OLE designers who managed to get it to work yeah and if you've got a, a stretch of line with a bridge next to a level crossing and then someone uh, clever comes and says please can we increase the line speed uh the uh, <laughs> uh the, 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 the the overhead line engineer usually throws something at you um because it, it, for them this is the the most complicated thing they can do um yeah, yeah. you know trying to manage all these expectations yeah. and then you're into mitigations which we never want to really be to yeah yeah and uh, and the other thing actually with OLE, which often gets forgotten, so people forget the OLE OLE stuff, but also people e more even more frequently forget the power supply stuff. If you want to be mm. running a load of faster trains, what's that doing to your power supply? Because that involves serious heavy additional infrastructure, and not only that, it involves serious additional heavy infrastructure outside of the existing railway boundary, which means that you're increasing lead times and making things a lot more complicated uh, to deliver. Um, uh, shout out to Gordon, who does, who, who's, who always catches me whenever I mention anything that doesn't involve, you know, whenever I go run lots more frequent trains when HS2 finishes, he says, yes, do that. But to do that, you need to start planning the power supply upgrades right now, please. That's not um, Mr. Jokes, is it? It Gordon, is, Gordon, yes, he's got, it uh, is, me, yeah. me and Gordon Jokes won the graduate scheme together, would you believe? Oh, so they are. <laughs> there you go, yeah. There you go, there you go. So there's a connection for you. <laughs> there you go, yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, so so power supply requirements. You know, if you're going to run more uh, faster trains, what are the power supply requirements? Uh, large, uh, likely. Um, so, yeah, uh, yeah, lots of stuff. Many, many things to think about. And we want, to be honest, neither of us have scratched the surface there, actually. There's, there's uh, so no, and, and uh, an engineering project, uh, just to increase a line speed, uh, you, you're talking, you know, tens of people, project management, you know, years of development work, just to think this out. So we're not going to, we're not going to scratch the surface of it. But you, I hope people will kind of appreciate that, we're not doing this because we don't want to. <laughs> yeah, we're not um, being awkward and trying to earn yeah. a, earn a consultancy fee. This is because yeah. these things, the, the railway is a very complicated thousand piece jigsaw, and it's not fixed and sorted until you've got every piece in place, right? Absolutely, yeah. And, and we don't, we, we we're not uh, reticent to do this because because we don't, we can't. Um, there's always a solution, but unfortunately, the solution often comes with a big price tag. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> um, right, so. Ah, well, this is back. Well, let's, so having said that, let's chuck the ball back in your court and talk a bit about signaling impacts um, and some more di some diagrams, which you which which um, which aren't mine. And I, <laughs> I think you filched as or you filched some of these as well. So, um, uh, so this one, this one is mine. Oh, uh, is there's, oh, there's a diagram which is definitely stolen and I will uh, attribute that <laughs> correct accordingly later. Um, so I guess this is kind of a this is an interesting one. Um, if you don't know how the railway signaling system works, um, and it's I guess it's kind of its purest form. So a, a, a train is not driven like a car. Um, you don't see the the red light at the at the ahead of you like you do at a, a, a junction with your car and just stop the train. The, the braking distance of a train is is so vast comparatively because of the low friction that the way the signaling system works is it the the yellow signals there shown are um, giving the driver the foreknowledge that the next signal is at red. So as the driver approaches that, that, that yellow signal, they apply the brake and they stop in plenty of time before the red signal. And that's, that's how the signaling system is designed, um, which is all well and good. Um, uh, the, the signals are placed there, braking distance, and that's, that's all happy days. But for those of you who can see the obvious uh, buts coming, uh, <laughs> as you increase the speed, um, those signals need to be further apart. And it's not just one signal. As you move, you might may only need to increase the line speed between A and B there. You know, the, the, you know, the, the number one signal at the top there and the number, the, the yellow signal in between. But because of the braking distance, 
um, cascade, essentially. You move one signal back 200 meters and suddenly the one behind it needs to move 200 meters. But unfortunately, there's a bridge. OK, well, we can't have the signal on the bridge. So that one needs to move 500 meters back. Oh, no. Well, that's now as a 500 meter impact on the one behind that. And thus, thus you've ended up um, rebuilding half the railway network um, just to increase the line speed for a short section. Yeah. Um, this problem goes away somewhat when you um, move to sort of an in-cab ETCS type solution, um, which is the European train control system, um, which is coming on the East Coast mainline. But for the vast majority of the, the, the network, um, uh, th this this is going to be a long standing problem. And, and line speed raises sort of out with the um, a, a, a larger project will always have this kind of cascade issue with, with signal breaking distances. And, and that's kind of... Um, an obvious thing. Um, the other thing um, that we like to talk about in signaling is something called the headway distance. Um, so uh, if you imagine a train that is just beyond the red signal, um, so if you, if you, if you uh, Gareth's excellent yeah, drawing John here. John Madness in there. Yeah, yeah, it's there more go, like yeah. the original one that you had. Oh, that's that's on exactly there. what the original looked like. I've got a picture of it on just off the other screen. Yeah. And, um, your <laughs> is much better than mine. Um, that's the, the distance between those two trains, essentially. The, the point where the, the second train is no longer seeing any sort of um, restrictive aspects the, the, the driver is purely driving on green signals um, is a defined distance and as you can see there the red signal protects the rear of the the um, the, 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 the uh, jankily drawn one uh, yes. <laughs> and, uh, the, uh, uh, the 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 driver of the uh, the second train has only just sighted the, the green aspect of the, the signal head and that distance is known as the headway distance um, uh, and obviously depending on the line speed um, that is an associated headway time. Um, but as you increase the distance between um, uh, between those, those signals, that headway obviously increases. And while the speed might have increased to maybe compensate, um, you can draw a nice graph basically um, uh, that shows that as the speed increases, uh, the headway does not always follow quite as linearly. Um, which is probably a good explanation as to why London Underground trains all run at the same speed. 40 miles an hour, I believe, is the sort of standard mm -hmm. speed. Run. And are you, because the reason being, that gets you the most bang for your buck. It's the, it's the quickest journey time for the most capacity. Um, and you can you can graph that quite nicely if, if you want, if you, if you draw that up. Um, it, below is a, a sort of way of being very clever um, with the signaling system to get you a bit more capacity. Um, um, but yeah, um, I don't agree with the Laffer curve personally. Um, but as you can see, there's a beautiful distribution uh, curve there, where there's somewhere in the middle is the answer. <laughs> yeah, it's not quite that. That's me, uh, very much John Maddening, <laughs> a thing to vaguely show you kind of what we're talking about. Don't, don't. This is not the answer to the exam question, folks. Don't, don't, no, don't, yeah, don't. don't. Yes, no. Uh, <laughs> don't make the whole network forty miles an hour because if I want to go see my mum, uh, it will take me about a month to get from Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's just that's to not sort the of, yeah. yeah. Um, but if, if you're in terms of pure capacity, that's that's that, which is what. Yeah, if you're if you're wanting to maximise, as the thing I always talk about about passengers per hour per direction, then then this is kind of what this this graph is referring to. And and so for like urban transit systems, yeah, forty mile an hour is not a bad not a bad way to maximise that conveyor belting. Um, yeah. Yeah, and, and so w when we talk about the signaling system here. Uh, the impacts of raising the line speed can be can be quite vast. You, you, you can knock out significant amount, significant amounts of um, of capacity by raising the speed. And as we kind of alluded to with with HS2, people that kind of say I'll just make the, the main line network faster um, don't realise what they're saying. If we want to save twenty minutes, make the trains go faster. Well, that's fine, but then you've knocked out half the services between London and Birmingham to achieve that. Um, so. The, the the capacity argument uh, is, is important there. And so that comes back to what we've said, the railway is a system. So what's the, if we want to raise the line speed, is the is the capacity an issue? Uh, are there other things restricting the capacity and or, or is the, the line speed the king here? Mm. And um, the signaling system is, is more than, um, more than just uh, some numbers and some sticks with some lights on them. The, the signaling system, I like to think of it, is the, the great link between the infrastructure and the operator in many ways. The, 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 the signaler um, in the signal boxes or the control centers are, are controlling where the trains go from and to, and the driver is interpreting the signals to, to, to know uh, where to go to. And so their understanding of the signaling system and when we change it is, is, is key. And the one that really matters here is signal sighting. Um, for, for a train driver. So um, 
signal sighting is a, is a complicated issue and you could probably do a whole round to just talking to an expert in signal sighting um it, it, yes. it is uh one of uh, the darkest of the dark arts yeah. of the studio's <laughs> toolbox um essentially to summarize um a driver of a train can't be expected to just like glance and see a signal and hope for the best if you're doing 125 miles an hour you need to be able to understand interpret and view a, a signal um such that you can interpret what it's telling you in such a good time that you can then action it in the correct way now it's a roughly 10 seconds depending on the on, on the signal it depends on lots of different things and that's all part of the assessment you undertake but 10 seconds at 100 miles an hour is, is a feral distance um uh, so yeah a, a beautifully drawn tree um a, a classics the ole yeah there we go uh platform uh someone sticking a a, a nice uh, uh sign up in the, in the in a platform um recently had a signal sighting issue where someone from i think it was morrison's or other supermarkets are available in green um yeah. had put a bright sign behind the signal and the driver from the wrong angle could see the signal but also see the morrison sign um uh, and you, it was a question of interpretability at that point. So drivers take this very seriously and, it, and impediments to signal sighting can drive down the speed because obviously if you can't see it quick enough, you can't interpret it, therefore you can't go that fast. And this has always been the barrier to going faster than 125 miles an hour in the UK is that simply a human eye um, to, to achieve the sort of sighting distance you'd need to, to do that, it's, it's difficult at best. Um, and, yeah, so and it's not like it's 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 not that it's impossible it's just that all of those different risk factors of the, the 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 time of glancing or blinking or sort of stretching or doing something some activity that's that's associated with driver load um increases the likelihood that you could miss something and then and then obviously the consequences are more severe so yeah yeah so um, when we look at when we look at higher speeds uh the the the, the view has always been if you want to go above 125 miles an hour, miles an hour the signaling system comes into the cab and so when we move to something like ETCS um, uh, in the future, um, there are probably parts of the network where there could be faster um, uh, faster bits of track because the signaling system no longer is the impediment. Um, however, going back to the, you know, tying it nicely back to the systems engineering, we have to understand what those impacts are on everyone else. Yeah. From a signal engineer point of view, the problem's gone away. But for yourself in track, for the civil engineer, for the OLE engineer... And for the timetable like, planners. <laughs> the timetable <laughs> yeah. planners, suddenly you know, we've just caused them a huge headache. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, and it, it's kind of my... Although I might be wrong on this, and I, and I wouldn't mind too much if I was, but my gut feeling is that on, on our existing dedicated network... Oh, oh, sorry, not our dedicated... Where we have existing mixed traffic lines, so basically all of our current network... Um, apart from HS1, um, where we have the existing network, I don't see us ever going over 100. And, I don't see us ever going over 200 kilometers an hour, over 125 miles an hour. I think the only thing time that will happen is if we start having more uh, actual segregation in other parts of the network. So if you start doing segregated lines that aren't necessarily dedicated total high speed lines, but say say you split out the four tracks north of York and and actually have a dedicated that's only for high speed trains bit. Um, which isn't the case at the moment because you'll see all the little slow local trains will still use the fast lines even though they're called the fasts. I don't think we'll ever see 125 mile, you know, 125 plus uh, speeds because it hits capacity too hard. I, I'd agree. And the, 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 in 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 braking terms as well, the, the 125 mile an hour um, braking of a um, passenger train balances quite neatly with about 60 to 75 miles an hour on a freight train because mm. a freight train takes longer to stop so because of this superior sort of braking ability of, of a passenger train the, the the braking spacing that you can achieve with that versus a freight um is comparable so in terms of in capacity terms those two neat, meld quite neatly together yeah, yeah. so as you as you increase the speed of the passenger train um that starts that, falling that, that, away that starts very quickly. Yeah. becomes a problem quite quickly. Yeah, yeah. And the other thing is, that above 200 kilometers an hour, the um, maintenance requirements on the track, 200 kilometers, this is one of the things I teach, 200 kilometers an hour is kind of a very useful threshold below which you can basically, the position of the rail, the running edges, so that the, that actual maintenance tolerance can be quite flexible, plus or minus 25 millimeters, if you like. Uh, above 200 kilometers an hour, so 125 miles an hour, um, you start you basically can't tolerate the bangs and shakes because the energy is so much higher because of the speed so actually you need plus or minus 0.5 millimeters and so that threshold pretty much is at 200 kilometers an hour yes you could sort of gradiate it a bit but actually what that means is any if you start running things over 125 miles an hour your maintenance liability will leap up tremendously 
um, particularly if you've got mixed traffic running still um, with those lines. So yeah, I, I think there's a lot of contributing factors that mean we won't see it, um, certainly not on our mixed traffic existing network anytime soon. Yeah, um, yeah, interesting. So that so that's uh, yeah, yeah, cab signaling. So, so not, not, this, yeah, that's, that's 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 all how you how you do that. But I guess this is all seems like bad news, and everyone who's watching yeah. this is probably going, "Oh, these boys don't know what they're on about." Like, how you can't? How can we reduce journey times then? If we can't make the trains go faster. Uh, you know, how do we? If we can't run at 140 miles an hour, how, how are we possibly going to achieve the sort of journey times we need to do to outcompete air and, and do all these things? And, and I have just the solution for you. Aha, yes. <laughs> um, and here it is: <laughs> make the slow bits faster. Is uh, yeah. Um, and if if I could get this uh, on a stamp, uh, I would stamp this on practically every report that comes out of every. <laughs> Uh, transport uh, transport paper ever written because this is the solution to making trains go faster mm. and, and I, I say that with no flippancy whatsoever um, and I think uh, I've prepared I think we may have already prepared a, a good example Ooh, yes. uh, here which is a little bit loaded but you'll you'll get the, yeah, get the so idea <laughs> we have two two nice uh, images here um, one of them uh, conveniently enough and interestingly enough shows the former uh, King's Cross uh, station throat uh, more on that momentarily. Uh, the other is just a picture of a ruddy HST slamming along um, a fair old lick. And so, yeah, um, uh, I shall narrate and then you can interject whenever you like, uh, Steve. So uh, the first example uh, is um, is basically saying, yeah, one mile at 50 miles an hour takes four minutes, right? I'm saying this as if I've come up with these. No, no, Steve has come up with these. I'm just saying them and I don't even know why I've decided to, but I am. Uh, one mile at 40 miles an hour takes 1.5 minutes. So that increase in speed from 15 to 40 miles an hour saves two and a half minutes, right? Uh, if you're at full speed, so if you have a, uh, if you have here, we've got the HST going along, um, 20 miles at 100 miles an hour takes 12 minutes. 20 miles at 125 miles an hour takes nine and a half minutes, which again saves two and a half minutes. So that's 20 miles of, of, of fairly, all, as we've just discussed, pretty massive infrastructure and associated operational uh, ramification work whereas uh, just one mile of uh, of line speed improvement from only 15 to 40 miles an hour saves just the same amount of, amount of time um yeah pretty uh, and, and just just to point out it's very common to have lots of snc switches and crossings and point work that is basically so that station throughout there you can see the massive 50 mile an hour speed board in the middle of it that is the, that was the traversing speed through uh king's cross throat and actually i dare say quite a few drivers didn't dare go above 10 given the state of some of that point work before the uh, before the renewal um and then up, up, you know, increasing the speed of those to forty miles an hour is quite standard. That's that's a pretty standard thing to, to you know, a forty mile an hour crossover turnout um, is not is not kind of beyond the wit of society. Yeah. So, Steve, I think these are tremendous examples. Um, it's it's good, I think, because it kind of shows um, that just chucking up one hundred twenty five mile an hour board isn't the solution. Because also, I mean, what 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 are you doing when you're coming towards a station? You're you're braking. Um, but you're probably breaking down from 60, 70, 100 miles an hour. And so breaking down to 40 is obviously preferable. But if you're already doing 75 miles an hour, to increase and accelerate up to 125 versus 100 miles per hour is a significant energy and and effort. Um, whereas the other, the flip case is, 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 is easier. Um, yeah, so. Yeah in terms of sort of smoother braking and, and the way that we approach it that's that's a that's a it's a really good example and and things like um where do you get a free run of 20 miles sometimes of, to go 125 <laughs> miles an hour with, without a, a station call without a freight train without a, a local that's popping out in front of you um whereas every station in the country um that hasn't had its snc and out, out outside its its throats uh, renewed it's probably kicking around at some of these sort of speeds um yeah, yeah. the the example i will use here um uh, is one that i know really well um which is going into perth um in in yeah. scotland as you come out of the last mile into perth is is 15 miles an hour but um you, the, you, know, you can you can design an alignment through there that will get that up to 40 with no bother at all yeah. um versus you could increase the speed from Perth to Stirling 
uh, from 100 to 125 miles an hour and all the cost of that yeah enormous, <laughs> enormous. It's, it's huge because you, you know you've got a viaduct across uh, rivers you've got level crossings uh, which we'll probably come on to later there's all sorts of, of things you need to sort out if you do that whereas simply renewing the snc in not quite yeah. like for like um but you know a modern equivalent form probably a better way of putting it and, um, will save you the same amount of time. And it's a case of increasing returns in the, in the opposite sense of emission returns because when you're at low, in these lower speed areas, you're, you're, things like your overlaps, your signal, all, all the distances between signals and things are shorter, which means that you've got, you can play around with things. Okay, it's, it's, all, it's always tight in a constrained site, but you're not talking about huge knock-on, knock-on, knock-on because the distances are smaller, you can play around with things a little bit. You've got a bit more breathing room. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, and, and the, the design constraints are the, the things that are interesting. Like, so a plain line, 125 mile an hour design, I could practically teach anyone to do that in a day, right? That's that's not that's not why a signal engineer gets paid uh, to do their job. It's thinking about complicated uh, issues in in station throats like this. This is this is this is where the real the, the money is earned, basically. So, the, 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 for, for for me. Looking at these uh, these throats and, and and looking at how they're they're laid out and looking at how they are um, signalled, uh, more more importantly, um, will release a lot more speed. And I think uh, you know if you look at something like Glasgow to Aberdeen, uh, is the solution to increase the speed there? Probably not. But there's probably ways of grabbing at speed there that exist where there's currently restrictions on the existing speed um, that will garner as much time returned as a, uh, a simple speed increase on the bits that are already fast um yeah like getting more stuff up to 90 along some yes. of those routes is far more uh, useful than put, than suggesting that the the line speed which yeah it's probably, probably should have put a slide in for nomenclature here actually so I, and you might correct me on this because so in my head uh, line speed is the top speed that you can do on a line um so, for example, the line speed on the East Coast Main Line is 125 miles an hour. That doesn't mean that it's at any given moment, it's always 125 miles an hour. And that's where you have permissible speed restrictions, PSRs, which are um, as a result of all of these constraints we've talked about, which are uh, less than the line speed. So 110, 100, 105, whatever it happens to be. Um, yeah and there's also reasons you might use them for you, you can as we sort of said before about capacity issues you might lower the line speed artificially because it releases capacity yeah. it allows the signals to be closer together um through big complicated stations is the classic um uh, you know yeah, something so like reading station has got a slight speed restriction versus the rest of the west the, the great western main line because you need the capacity to get it through those um yeah 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 yeah. That yeah so you introduce a psr that actually brings that down and yeah yeah so so yeah so doing something like uh getting rid of a load of psrs or at least raising a load of psrs along a given route is more impactful than increasing the line speed from say you know 100 to 110 or something like that um particularly on these yeah. scottish routes where there are a lot of constraints lots of rural routes actually where um uh where, where you'd be beneficial of doing a of doing a road industry and cutting some of the corners you know maybe tightening or slackening some some well slackening some curves to improve some of the some of the, the getting rid of some of the um lower speed restrictions and, and hopefully fixing those problems but yeah station areas are, are the key one and that's one of the key things that's just happened at king's cross which steve i'm sure you can Tell us a bit about from from your, from from what you've seen of it, but um, so all standard S and C units, mm -hmm. all sort of um, kind of higher speeds, uh, you know, twenty five mile an hour minimum speed turnouts, plus improving the speeds kind of through. So so basically, the driver uh, kind of sat on any of the platforms now can almost kind of by the t they can basically go up to the top notch on the train and and move away at pretty decent pace. Because by the time they're reaching the higher, you know, the, the, the acceleration of the train is almost being matched to the, to the kind of the available uh, speed restriction at any given moment. So they can open up, open the trains up far more than in the past where they had to trickle along at trundle speed until they were clear of um, Gasworks Tunnel or whatever, or even Copenhagen Tunnel or wherever it was. Yeah, yeah, and that's a, 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 a King's Cross is a perfect example. And um, for the, those in the north of England, uh, the Liverpool Lime Street is the other classic example of that. The, the the way that that has been changed is exactly the same as what we've seen. Mm. What we've seen at King's Cross, the forty miles an hour um, allows you to sort the trains out higher speeds earlier into the right line so the driver can drive with confidence into the platforms into the buffer ends the, you know they're, they're naturally breaking down to a speed for the buffer ends based yeah. on their own rules and if the driver can simply as you say when they're leaving 
place the train into the maximum acceleration and essentially leave it to to, yeah. to, to go like that's that's the perfect situation mm. um in terms of in terms of capacity because they're not having to artificially hold back the train um particularly with an electric train which can which can accelerate at some rate of knots and, and there are other kind of knock-ons to this because okay we're talking about overall speed um uh, kind of overall, kind of, kind of reducing journey times, if you like, or, or making trains invert commas faster. But there are other second, secondary knock-on effects. So, for example, there are a lot of people who got very angry at the idea of King's Cross having one of its platforms taken out, mm. one of the suburban platforms was taken out. But actually, the whole point is that you don't, because of this improvement in speed coming out of the station throat, you don't need that extra platform, and you're still gaining capacity. Actually, you'd lose you lose capacity if you added the platform back in by taking that platform out. You're actually getting trains out of the throat quicker, which means that you can get them in and out of the platforms more quickly, which means that you can fit more trains per hour onto those platforms. Um, oh, I'm warming up the gong just as you speak, because this is this is a perfect example of it working as it should work. Um, this, the railway is a system. Yeah. And as we as we demonstrate here by um, by increasing the, the, the speed through that throat, you release capacity that you previously didn't have. Um, but obviously the knock-on effect means you lose a platform, but actually because you now have that capacity, you don't need that platform anymore. So there's a whole load of coping stones you don't need to maintain anymore. That's a load of CIS, so customer information systems, you don't need anymore. It's a load um, of extra potential platform space. It's reduced platform uh, yeah. train face risk because you've got fewer platforms to deal Absolutely. with. It's X, Y, Z. It's all these yeah. cascading da, 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 da. And you can you can see how, how you can easily write a thousand page report on this sort of stuff. Um, and quite regularly, I'm sure I have. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the, that no one other than other engineers they're interested to read normally <laughs> <laughs> so um so that so that i think is, is a really good example of 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 the right thing to be doing to getting to, to to improving and in this case as we say not just improving uh journey times while sacrificing capacity but actually improving journey times and improving capacity good absolutely good you, you, get, you get both here for, for you know, not for free because nothing's free but um certainly you you get the, the bonus there without reducing the capacity yeah yeah so um so and you've already alluded to this um but the next ha. thing you've got is giving the driver the confidence to go faster yeah this is uh this uh, this is the my stolen slide so um shout oh, yeah. out to, I'll, uh, I'll bring shout him up to, yeah here we uh, go andy blakely from uh from network rail in scotland who uh who did the original version of this but this is uh, <laughs> our, our kind of uh, knock together version of it um the, the kind of theory here is that train drivers, um, the, the way they are taught to drive trains and, and, the, and sort of the, the, the way that the drivers approach their job is, 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 is I guess, um, safety is, is obviously king, but they, they drive, I guess, in, in a slightly conservative manner. Like they, they, as, uh, when you see a yellow signal, the brake goes in. You're slowing down to stop at a red signal. And, and when you see a yellow signal, even if you know um, that perhaps that, oh, there's this because of the conditions of the track ahead, that I, you know, eventually that red signal will go away, you, you, you'll slow yourself down. And, and here's a good example on, on the screen here. Uh, there's a platform um, that this driver is approaching on their train. And for some reason, the signal that protects the platform is a red. And that could be that there's another train in the platform. That could be that there's something moving across the throat. Um, in front of it, there could be that there's no um, available overlap in front of the signal that, that exits. There could be all sorts of reasons for, for, for that. But for the driver, it doesn't matter. They've seen the yellow signal, the brake goes in. And so that, that, uh, that, that means that they're slowing down and they're slowing down ag aggressively um, to... I think uh, I think the current depends on the on the, the train operating company, but I believe the the current guidance is when they're about 200 meters away from a signal, they should be down to about 10 to 15 miles an hour. Um, so that's a that's a, a and, and that can be a quite a significant drop mm -hmm. from from line speed. And that signal, remember, is at breaking distance from the signal ahead, potentially at full line speed. So you could be a thousand meters out of the platform now. Um, so th this could be that could be some fair distance going going into that platform, which you now have to accelerate up to. Um, and you won't ever get back up to the full line speed again um, because you're stopping for the platform. So why would you? You'd, you'd accelerate up to a speed that's comfortable, then you'd break back down again for the platform itself. And, and so what we can see here is basically because, um, uh, as Andy uh, described it, we've waved the yellow light and then the red light at the at the driver. They know, they, they go no break and slow yeah. down and 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 uh, that eats into the 
Yeah, it's, uh, it's the speed standard of the track. defensive driving, as, as yeah, they call absolutely, it. Absolutely, yeah. And, and, and uh, yeah. it's right; it's the safe way to do it. it means that there's no yeah. risk. Uh, you know, they're, they're minimizing the chance they're going to pass a, t- uh, a signal at danger. Absolutely, and there's the signaling controls that do this artificially. Essentially, if, if, the, if the, the the nature of the SNC ahead of the the, the red signal outside of the platform there are, are such that the, they do not allow the train to go over within certain um, requirements, the signal will be artificially held at red. So essentially, because this is this is the outcome we want. Basically, we want the driver to slow down so they can then take the the, the, the track ahead of them comfortably. Um, now, if we move to the next slide, I think uh, this demonstrates how you can improve that. So we remove the restriction. Either we do that by improving the track so the, 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 that restriction is not, not required anymore. The, the layout changes. Something is done, essentially, to allow the driver to drive in confidently. Um, there's, there's a whole, and this is going to, like, I, I could give you thousands of examples of how you could do this depending on the geography, but um, the, the fundamental is what, what, what you're now doing is allowing the driver that's approaching this platform to not break for the red signal. They're breaking for the platform because that red signal won't be on the end of the platform quite as neatly as it is there probably. It might be <laughs> off the end. It's, you know, it could be anywhere um, beyond that signal, or beyond that platform. But even then, what they're doing is is rallying their train and, and, and breaking for the platform. And so for those of you um, who um, passed your higher grades or uh, A-level maths, uh, you'll know that the area under that curve, uh, the difference between the, 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 the red and the green there is uh, time. And that, that is all pure time saving. And we've not increased the line speed there. That, that, is, that was without a single touch of the mm. line speed. The, the line speed is exactly the same in both of those examples. But the difference is here is the driver is given the confidence to drive into the platform at the maximum allowable speed that they can stop for the platform. And, and that is all time saved. So do we need to increase the line speed to achieve that? And the answer is no. No, because the speed here is the speed is this, this, this is our, our, our speed here. And it's just exactly, you know, the limit is exactly where it was the whole time. Absolutely. You can flip yeah. back and forth and you can see, actually, I, I shall get rid of my scribbles and you can see <laughs> You can see the difference. There, there we go. That that area, this area here, is is the time saving. And that's not an insignificant amount. If if you're coming down from fifteen uh, to, to fifteen, ten, fifteen miles an hour on approach to that 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 yellow signal or the red signal in the um, the previous example, you, you're it is a huge amount of um, of, of time saving um, because the driver of a modern train can can break. Um, relatively confidently into that platform passing that signal maybe at full line speed to be honest uh so it, it's a huge uh time saving in overall without touching any of the underlying componentry um without changing any of the civil engineering without any of the uh, systems impact that is a pure signaling change that allows that driver to drive more confidently and there's probably thousands of examples of this across the network mm. where you can we can achieve this kind of this betterment mm. And I suppose it, yeah, it's it's interesting because it's looking at behaviors as much as it's infrastructure and engineering. It's behaviors and and, and managing the managing the the kind of the risk. I suppose the risk averse nature of of drivers as as they rightly should be. I, I would not want a driver not to be risk averse in charge of a you know four hundred ton train or whatever it is with with me in it. Uh, my my old man drives trains, so I always ring him if I need an opinion. On a train <laughs> really? driver. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Um. <laughs> that's that's, that's uh, yeah. That's that's a useful uh, a useful sounding board. So. Yeah uh right the the next bit is is this is this point here which is which is kind of a key thing really i think that's a thread through all of this we talked about systems engineering we talked about it all but yeah don't think that you can escape unintended consequences right you know you can't <laughs> it's just not possible <laughs> is it no um yeah and, and I guess, yeah, the, the cascade of effects we've talked about there are some of the obvious infrastructure um sort of points that come with with higher speeds you know the impact on the, the civil engineer and the impact on the overhead line these are obvious uh, things so that, that even even someone who perhaps isn't as well versed in railway engineering would you know with a little prompting would pick up all right yes of course if you go faster the impact on the civil engineering is going to be bad but there are other things that happen on the railway that do have relations to the speed and i think those impacts are always uh not always missed but sometimes uh, underplayed and a, a key example for me is always level crossings. The number one risk uh, to, to, to any railway system is um, when you allow a car to drive across it. Um, 
fundamentally the, the systems are safe like they, 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 it's, it's not pretend they're not but when you allow a a, a car to um <laughs> to encroach within the railway boundary fence suddenly you, you have a problem and so we manage that via warning times there's flashing lights there's barriers there's cameras there's all sorts of stuff but as you increase the um the the speed that warning time needs to increase of course it does because the driver still needs to um be able to stop the driver of the car that is and the driver of the train needs to uh, alert this kick this in into into further um uh, yeah further out so you suddenly have this huge level crossing impact and certain level crossings are only allowed on certain line speeds so there's a threshold depending on the types of crossings and level crossings are not cheap anytime you have to interact with the public essentially um you you're into a world of pain of of planning permission and legislation that's far above and beyond um a normal line speed increase and so it's not a case of simply moving some striking points and that train can go faster you might end up doing a, a multi-million pound level crossing renewal um or building a bridge which is yeah, the real answer bridges, yeah, <laughs> so I, yeah I, I before you even started speaking i was like right i'm gonna draw some level crossings because like, that is and so the other thing so so we talked obviously there's the car ones but but um you know user work crossings is yes. a good example and it's something that maybe you, know, you can have these still uh operating quite high speeds but there's the behavioural element, and actually, we did this. This this relates to not just this, this covers a lot a lot of different things on on the railway. Um, we I was working on the Tony uh, Metro, uh, working on the Metroflow project, which is um, changing, which is re essentially redoubling, but with exist two mostly two existing tracks. And there's that behavioural element of well, previously freight trains went round the back, and now they're going to be going down the front, and it's the same for things like level crossings. If you increase speed, people are used to seeing a train in the distance and knowing, oh, that train, I know I can cross safely when that that's just about to see the train, I can get across safely. If that train is going, you know, ten, twenty percent faster, all the all those thousands of people who potentially are crossing there a year, all the behavioural stuff changes. All of those people are now going to be putting themselves in greater risk, and that's that's you know without any change actually to happen to the infrastructure necessarily at that point. Yeah, and th this is key. And and uh, I have I have personal experience with, with doing this. We, we we changed some approach controls similar to the way we laid out there, um, and there was. Um, a level crossing within the, the footprint of that and exactly what you said there the behaviors of the people have not changed because you know if you've been crossing that line for 20 years mm. you're not going to be aware that the, the railway engineers have increased the speed yeah. and so that where that where you thought the train where you thought it was safe to cross the line is no longer safe and and uh, then then you have to have a very uh, serious conversation with the level crossing manager about how you deal with that and the answer might be we put the speed back down because it's simply yeah. not possible for the person to cross the line safely at that point and so now we've we've undone everything we try to do so we've done all the good work but we have to un undo it again yeah, because yeah. actually the, the safety of the, the public particularly those who are not actually involved in the railway system are is, is paramount and, and, and the, we have to take responsibility for that um, and, and these kind of consequences you, you don't really know until you start looking at it um, and so it's, it's kind of hard to um, hard to hard to quantify in some ways uh, another sort of classic is um there's more than just level crossings for, for, for staff working on the railway, um, even with um, it, some still with lookouts, but uh, hopefully that's been phased out quite quickly. Um, but with like train uh, track based warning systems, um, they may all need renewed. You know, how do you how, how do you safely maintain the railway with the, with, the, with the track open? The answer is you don't. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but, you know, th those kind of safety systems that were built in there for staff use that 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 all may need changed and, and and in terms of um the signaling system as a whole uh we kind of talked about junction signaling and, and how you can do that that those kind of impacts of changing the the speed ratio of between the the turnout roads and and the straight on um are very very finely balanced and mm. so by increasing the speed of the straight on route you may throw off the the turnout route um and the speed that's achievable through that because you need to restrict the ability for the train to go too fast through the wrong line essentially. Ah, okay yeah ah that's interesting i didn't even know that that's yeah i didn't realize yeah. there's a ratio there that's, uh... there there is um so broadly uh 10 miles an hour um from straight on to turnout and, and your grand you can you can do that with no controls whatsoever and then as you step up from that essentially if you're above about 60 miles an hour you need the turnout to be about 40 miles an hour to allow a, a flashing yellow approach um if you're above if you're below 70 miles an hour then it, that speed goes down but if you're uh, if you can't meet those criteria 
then essentially you have to hold the protecting signal at red. Um, so okay, as the driver, yeah. so your approach release condition. So if you had a 100 miles an hour right, a line and you had a, a 10 mile an hour turnout, you'd need to have an approach release control on that. So the driver is artificially held to a red signal to allow them to slow down, which is then uh, allow, is allowed to step up when certain conditions are met so that the, the, the speed is essentially curtailed. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, oh yeah, that, well there we go. That's uh, what do you do about old? Re- oh, let, let, let tell you what. Let's not even go there. That's, that's, <laughs> we could go for hours. Yeah. I, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. So that, I mean, unintended consequences. A huge potential cascade of them that that can knock literally knock us flat. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I, I mildly unrelated now, but the, the unintended consequences example I often give is that. Um, uh, that there was a change to operating procedures that resulted in a charter train going through one of the tunnels on the uh, on the Transpennine route, um, slower that there is actually there's actually a minimum speed for gauging purposes, um, because at trundle speed, your v- if you're on a curve, your train hangs right. At, uh, that's that's no, I can't. If you're if you're, going on, if you're on a curve and your train's really at at at, at, at low speed or zero it kind of sits in on its suspension because inertia is yeah. not pulling it up out the curve. So actually, through this particular platform up, uh, tunnel, um, the low sp- that low speed actually caused a gauging infringement and caused the charter of Mark 1 coaches to scrape the inside of the... Uh, mm. Uh, scrape through the inside of the tunnel, which wasn't very nice for all the all the people on board trying to enjoy their cup of tea and, and scone. Um, so, yeah, uh, unintended consequences. You wouldn't think of low speed as being a dangerous sit- uh, situation, but it can be. Um so yeah, uh, there we go. Unintended consequences. So, any other examples you can think of, Steve? Like, um, I, I, for, for me, um, I guess uh, any time you increase the speed, you increase the risk, right? Yeah, yeah. And so we've got hundreds of warning systems and 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 ways of mitigating this. We 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 have um, a big mathematical model and and things like that that, that works out the risk of uh, risk of signal overrun and, and things like that but as you increase that speed that risk naturally goes up it, it has to uh, otherwise uh, even if the cons- the, 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 the the actual um, likelihood has not changed the consequence is now yeah, much more yeah. significant um, the, you know the closing speed between trains um, so w- when you talk about these types of things it, it becomes uh, particularly complicated and we, and we need to be sort of mindful of the um, the way that, that that's managed and all those kind of the, the, the way that the the system's safety risk is managed against the output you're trying to achieve. So having talked about Im- improving and increasing line speeds <laughs> or, or, or generally, actually line speeds, that improving or increasing uh, or improving journey times rather. So making trains go faster, but improving journey times rather than increasing line speeds. As we said, increasing line speed isn't necessarily the solution to making trains go faster. Um, but having said that, we are now going to talk about Colton Junction. <laughs> of course we are. <laughs> and there's going to be a Colton Junction Rail Natter episode because obviously I'm totally obsessed with it. But um, but this might maybe is a teaser for that because uh, it's interesting and, and and you alluded to it being an interesting thing and, and particularly you alluded to the most interesting bit, not necessarily being the most um, visually sexy bit. So, um, but anyway, so uh, for anyone who doesn't know, Colton Junction, here's, here's, here's the middle of Colton Junction or rather, actually Colton Junction is three separate junctions. There's, there's Colton Junction South there's, or is it South Colton Junction? It's, then there's Colton uh, Junction. I'm looking at my, my drawing I've got here. It is Col- Colton North Ladder, Colton Junction, and Colton South Ladder are the correct ah, names. Ah, interesting, because the signs, <laughs> the signs, the, the, the signs in rail alphabet say either Colton Junction South or, or South Colton Junction, and vice versa. <laughs> so, um, anyway, yeah. See what the drawing says when we lift it up we'll in a second. See what the drawing cause... says, and the drawing <laughs> is king. So forget the signs on the on the forget the signs that I video when I go past. Anyway, this is this is the sexiest part of Colton Junction in terms of P-Way, which is the the equal splits, um, at 125 miles an hour, sending trains in either direction. And often the reason I like this Colton Junction is because, well, huge numbers of reasons. Uh, you know, foresight of engineers, simplicity. But one of the key interesting things is people often say, well, you know, grade separation is what you have to do to get the best junction, right? And actually, that's not always true um, because, you know, you've got to introduce if you're if you're doing grade separation, that means you're introducing things like gradients, which means that you're potentially slowing trains down as they have to go. Around. So actually, potentially you aren't. It isn't the best situation. And actually, a, 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 I'm not going to name the project because it's mildly contentious but there is a big project going on at the moment somewhere on network rails infrastructure where a grade separation 
isn't the best option actually and, and we de- we actually as as, as designers uh arcadis actually took that option you know showed that option was unnecessary um to achieve uh the the the, the kind of the best most optimized capacity kind of a bit like colton junction anyway i've waffled about colton junction <laughs> enough um however is there anything you want to say while this picture's up or shall i get the uh shall so- i get the layout plan up from a signal engineering point of view, like, like I alluded to earlier with the, the 10 mile an hour split, this is a perfect example of, of a, a completely equal um, split. So you don't need any junction controls here to, 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 to protect this junction because it's so fast in both directions. There's no no reason to apply a control here. Mm. Um, so it acts as plain line in both directions, which is quite interesting. But if you if you show the drawing, then uh, it yeah, might become more apparent why, why, why I'm less interested in this bit and yeah. more interested in the <laughs> other bits. So, so basically, uh, for you, by this point, this is just plain line in each direction. So you don't care from a, from a signaling perspective, eh, right? It's, yeah, it's, it's done, The trains like, are just running along. Yeah. And, whereas for me, this is the sexy bit because it's, yeah. look at that. Um, right, okay, drawing. So here is, uh, here is, I'm going to use my mouse. I can't John Madden on here, sadly, viewers. I do apologize. Um, but what I can do is, uh, hopefully this is fairly clear. For those of you looking at this on a mobile device, not a chance. Yeah, um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> but because it's it's very it's quite a faded scan of a. But anyway, right. This is the that's this is the sexy bit. It doesn't look very sexy on the layout plan. Whoever drew this, oh man, come on, have a bit of have a bit of self respect. This could look so much. We're only anyway. working one dimension in Siglin, so don't expect anything. Yeah. So. <laughs> so you don't care about this. Don't be too lonely. Yeah. So, um, but this is but this is an interesting bit. So uh, let's start uh, let's start this direction for you. These ah yeah look it does say Colton North Junction. There we are. Mm. It says Junction, not Ladder. Interesting. Weird. What bit were you looking at? Have you got another I've got, different? I've got a quail map open. Oh, so that's what the quail map says. Uh, but yeah, the uh, right. uh, this is the what the signaling scheme plan says. Um, so, um, uh, so here is so the, here is one of the ladders, and then at the other end, here is another ladder. Now, what, when we say a ladder, what we mean is a is a cross is a series of crossovers allowing a connection between parallel tracks, right? Um, parallel over a six foot or parallel over a, a 10 foot. Uh, actually, I think this is a wide way here, but anyway, it's kind of mm. a moot point. Um, so the, the different intervals between the tracks. So um, tell us why, tell us, d- describe, go on, give us a bit, explain why this, this junction is interesting and why these bits are the important bits. So I, I guess, uh, as we kind of talked about before, the, the, if, you're, if you imagine a train is coming from, uh, let's say, uh, the bottom left, it's, it's coming along uh, from uh, it's the, it's the down main, I believe. It comes coming towards, com- coming towards uh, the, the Colwyn Junction oh, proper. Oh, down. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so, yeah. So um, it's actually off the edge of the drawing. We pick the worst possible example. Uh, yeah. um, but we need to work in both directions. And, and as the train kind of comes through this junction here, um, it is essentially not impeded by any of the, the infrastructure as it comes along. So as it, it flies through this uh, this junction here and it carries along down, on the down main and, and you're in uh, you, you're really happy days as you carry along the, the down main. Now, if you're approaching on the uh, the down, uh, is it the down Normanton, I believe on the So uh, if you yeah, so that's the get... top top one, right, is the down Normanton. Uh, get, am down... I, is my down and up right? Because down, wait a minute, let me get my... That's the down leads, yeah, at the oh, top. Ah, sorry, the uh, down yeah. Normanton, which is this one here. The one here. So um, the signal's actually missing because I didn't screenshot it properly. But if you imagine <laughs> a train um, coming on that line, now there's two options you could take. You can go straight on as your mouse is doing there. And unfortunately, we're going to end up in a big train crash if you do that um, because the two trains will, uh, will, will will not be able to pass each other. There's you know the red signal and all that. I'm being flippant, but the, the, there's a conflict there. Yeah. So what the ladder does is it allows you to move across to the down leads at 70 miles an hour, which is a fair old heft yeah. um, um, on a, I think it's a hundred mile an hour approach here. So yep. you, you've got a, a fairly good run into that um, with you know, relatively little impediment with, with barely slowing. So one train has um, slowed from a hundred to 70. The other one has carried on at 125 miles an hour, quite a happy days. And they're, they're, they're not, um, impeding each other in any way shape or form and, and what that allows is um the these trains uh, to use these ladders and you can use them in both directions you, you could you could work out a scenario in the opposite direction as well if i um if i think but i'll try not to think on my feet too much where a, a train going the other way um moves in the through the ladder and and the junction in such a way that they essentially it's like a beautiful ballet they kind of like dodge around each other like mm. a like a, a tai chi or something like as the the trains kind of um, nip around each other in, in different manners and with the two the two ladders uh, lined as they are the junction almost doesn't matter um because it allows the two uh 
the, the trains to sort of maneuver around each other in in sort of a multitude of different ways. And um, if you can get hold of a a, a, um, a quail map or a diagrammatic version of the the layout, um, this is a, a kind of interesting point for anyone to do. Um, and you, you kind of see how we, we go about assessing layouts is get a pen. Um, in fact, get 10 pens of different yeah. colors um, and essentially draw you know, from the down main to the, the, the down leads and draw from the down leads to the down main. And how do you get from these different points? Um, some you won't be able to do, some you will. But what you'll notice about this junction as you, as you start coloring it in is there are re- relatively few conflict points. Um, and there's often multiple options for getting to the same place, mm. which allow you to maneuver around things that are also going on. And when you start thinking of it in those terms, what, what this is doing is it allows um, multiple moves to take place at once in the same way that a, a, a grade separation does. But this is a, perhaps a, a beautiful example of how to do that without grade separating. Now, you need a lot of space to do this. You wouldn't want yeah. to build this in, uh, in South London. Uh, like uh, or, or, this is or, this is where yeah, yeah this is where the, the southern <laughs> railway folks start that you know the southern region folks start laughing at us because we or, or laughing at me because I've I've plied my trade in in uh, eastern region where uh, we do have more space to this and the benefit of you know the national coal board paying for this as well <laughs> uh, thank you the national coal board uh, because this of course was as a consequence of the construction of the Selby diversion. So yeah, this got put in, and also you got the benefit of, of of nice space on the old roads towards Leeds. You know the the the, the York and North Midland routes towards uh, Normanton and and Leeds. So yeah, we did have lots of space. It's true. Yeah, and if you and if you've got the the converse example of of, of a tight space, I mean, if 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 I was to pitch you um, my uh, my counter example of where great separation is 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 a perfectly good, uh, you know, the perfect design airport junction on the Great Western Main Line is, uh, for my money, one of the best design junctions in the country um, in terms of the way it allows that capacity to be released um, for the trains coming on and off the, uh, the the airport line towards Heathrow versus the, the ones on the main line. Now, pre-Crossrail, it was probably quite bad, but post-Crossrail, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's much improved. It's a really, really neat piece of design, and it's a beautiful sort of... Um, I guess counter example to this in, in that it's very compact yeah, and Colton, yeah. obviously if you've got loads of room, this is exactly how you do it. Um, and, and uh, so for me, those two examples are probably, if you want to release capacity, you can probably get one or both of those somewhere in your, your layout. So if you've got loads of room, you get a Colton bang that in, in, in your, your layout and suddenly you've got a load of capacity, uh, with less bridges. But if you're a bit more tight for space, um, something like an airport junction, chuck that in and suddenly y- you don't have moves. Um, of, so what kills capacity in terms of junctions is um, trains wandering across them. Um, and I, 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 I use the, the term yeah. wander uh, uh, yeah. professionally there. The, 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 train is, the train is moving through the layout slowly because it has to. It's held there by the S&C. Um, but what these layouts allow you to do is to move those trains where they need to be sorted out to be in the correct place at the maximum speed that you can achieve. And so this is a great example of um, how to do that at 125 miles an hour, which is very rare. <laughs> um, you, you know, being able to do this sort of um, this sort of um, beautiful sort of ballet of, of trains at the speeds achieved here is, is quite exceptional. It's uh, what I'm going to do is, is now while this is this is going to be seriously pro. Oh no, I've not managed. It. I've not managed it. Uh, which is there's Colton, and I'm now gonna, and I'm now going to do this, and then I'm gonna do this and this. There we are. This is this is some serious magic. <laughs> and then if I do, uh, if I do this is this, we have Airport Junction. There you go. Look at that. That's why I was squirreling away in the background there. Um, actually, I do have a single. There is a single line diagram that I could have pulled up in fact the, i think this if you get if you go in fans of the show uh, i'd strongly recommend um carto metro's map of london and i think carto metro's map of london is uh has this quite nicely shown uh, in terms of it kind of nicely shows the, the the grade separation anyway here's a picture of it so this is what a grade separated junction looks like where you have less space and you but also i'd say where you've got um you, you can afford to do the gradienty stuff because the trains that are using the gradienty stuff are all lightweight metro trains that don't really care yeah. about gradients, right? 
Yeah, and, and this, this is a this is a great example because of the, um, the, the the lightweight metro trains here can achieve um, gradients that simply wouldn't be possible with other trains. You know, I think these are one in forty, one in fifty climbing yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Up, up these these ramps. There, they're they're steep. Um, but you, you, on the sort of the the right hand side of this drawing here, um, uh, you, you, that that that's one hundred and twenty five mile an hour main line running line. That's the that's the that's the main line between mm. London and Bristol. Um, so trains. Uh, nipping off here and getting in the way of them is, is going to be uh, problematic. You know, every train that, um, if you didn't have this this kind of layout here, every train that comes from Heathrow, which is a relatively regular service, slows down every train coming from Bristol. So you need a very comprehensive layout here. Yeah. And this is a good example of how you do that. Um, release that capacity by keeping, the, but keep the speed. Um, the, the speed through here is, is still pretty significant. I think it's I think it's got 75 mile an hour turnouts, yeah, yeah. Um, particularly on the on the down main, I believe. Uh, so it, it's it's a great bit of design, and um, a shout out to my colleague Will Cavill, who was the uh, the man uh, certainly behind the uh, the signaling design of this 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 particular layout oh, nice. yeah. um, back in the uh, the Crossrail days, uh, where I where I, I applied my trade when I first died. I didn't do anything quite as uh, sexy as this when I first died. Unfortunately, <laughs> uh, I was I was stuck at Maidenhead Depot. Oh, uh, mm. <laughs> and it's yeah, it's in, and and what's interesting is that um, people often sort of suggest that you know digital signaling and ETCS and, and, and ERTMS so ETCS European traffic uh, train control sorry European train control system and ERTMS European uh, rail traffic management system uh, amongst along with other things as well uh, that gets called digital you know digital railway uh, often call this as a kind of a panacea and that it might somehow solve lots of problems but actually for that to work well we actually need more of these you know, ETCS uh, and ERTMS work best when they have segregated nice junction layouts not when you have really complicated dense messes of junction layouts uh, and we have a signaling design engineer who can 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 add to that but but yeah, yeah. My, my, my understanding is that we actually will need to build more of these actually to to get the best out of it yeah the the, the the two go hand in hand there are there are things you can grasp out with etcs certainly that you can get more capacity but something like this layout you, there's no way of signaling this with etcs that improves the capacity beyond yeah. what's already there. You maybe a few seconds here and there that you could just nip away at. But the um, the overall grand scheme of things is you need the bridge. The, the reason the bridge got built is because you need the bridge. Yeah. And um, the way we designed Siglin, uh, and then we'll get into some deep law now. Um, the the the, <laughs> the, um, the the Siglian system isn't uh, designed, you know, uh, like a car or a tram where you, you drive to a, you know, it's a constantly moving um, object. It's it's set up as a series of routes. Um, so from an A to a B and in, in a classic signaling system, it's from one signal to the next. And even in ETCS, that's how it works. That's how the, the block system that underpins the signaling safety system is is derived. It's a mm. requirement in law, um, not just uh, not just a railway thinks it's best. It's the, from the regulation of railways yeah, that, yeah. That, uh, that 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 is laid out. So that that block system uh, is required. And, and when you, you talk about a junction area, particularly, you don't signal to like one set of points. You signal through the junction because you want the driver to be able to, as we've said, confidently drive through the layout. And if you're constantly letting them sort of trundle along up to an ever increasing uh, movement authority, that is not giving you more capacity. That's a driver driving slowly through S and C. Yeah. Um, so if you want to have that driver drive confidently through it, you need to lock the layout up and, and protect the, the train. And so ETCS still requires you to do that. The underpinning signaling principles are no different to the lights on sticks. It's just that it's now in the cab. Um, you can play a few tunes on it. You're not constrained as much by braking distance, but um, the, the the way, because that's all calculated in the train, but the, the way that the layout actually works in real terms for trains running at full speed, you, you still need something like this to actually achieve it. Yeah. Yeah. Steve, right. Well, oh, I mean, we've good grief. <laughs> I mean, we've covered a lot there. I mean, I've just realised I've just realised we overrun by uh, thirteen minutes as of just as I said <laughs> it there, uh, which is not the worst overrun we've done. Um, uh, let's let's do this, Steve. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks. Thanks for that. That's been really thanks interesting. For having me. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. It's a pleasure. I could yeah. talk to you about this for hours. So <laughs> yeah, we could both definitely go off on on on, on one for ages. We I mean we managed to sneak in a little extra chat on on on, uh, on airport junction there, which is nice. Also, weirdly, airport junction for a while was the place where we had uh, some RT60 swing nose crossings for a while that then got ripped out. 
uh, because uh, they didn't work very well. So, uh, <laughs> which people now who watched uh, Rail Natter two weeks ago uh, will know what I mean by that because I videoed some Vossel <laughs> Swingers crossings. Anyway, right, I digress hopelessly, as is so often the case. Um, I'm now going to press. Uh, I'm going to press this button here. Uh, as ever, we are available in podcast form. Uh, for those of you who don't care for the John Madden uh, diagrams and and pictures, and who just enjoy relaxing, listening to this uh, often as a, an aid to insomnia, then um, then yep, yeah, we are available on all good podcasting platforms. And um, also, also, also. The, the 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 ads uh, so patreon uh, supporters thanks as ever uh, this was one of your suggested themes i'm getting back sinking my teeth back into the list of requests so um yes if you're a patreon supporter you can support me patreon.com slash gareth dennis and you get to choose future episodes themes guests uh and you get the there's the bonus video from the real live episode which you've all been watching and enjoying i hope uh, and also you get asked inane production questions by me like for example how does this work and help um so uh the Discord server is where the chat happens. Um, there are lots of people in there who you can chat to. Uh, GarethDennis.co.uk slash Discord. And then if you just want to throw loose change at me violently, then uh, PayPal.me slash GarethDennis is where you can do that. And also, because I keep getting told off for not doing it, yeah, please do press the buttons that you can press, uh, ideally the favourable ones associated with this video on the YouTube. Uh, thanks for doing that. Um, uh, and now now over to... So, Steve, we have here the definition of refugee which I really like. Um, <laughs> Refuigi, a person who upon arrival in Glasgow is embraced by the people of the city, a person considered to be local. See also Glaswegian. We're all for somewhere. Uh, I did that in an East Coast accent because I decided to not try my Glaswegian accent and just do it in my kind of slightly more exaggerated own accent. You, you'll which get cancelled by the East whole Coast. nation of Scotland. Or well, yeah, at least the like, city of Glasgow. So. Yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> Glasgow will cancel me if I, like, try to, if I, as a, an East Coaster, try to impersonate a, a Ouija accent. I, I have a variety I, 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 of different Ouija accents, and I, I'm not going to do any of them on this uh, on this episode. I won't dare because my wife will burst in through the door and, and beat me about the head. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so we'll but, not do that. Yes, yeah, Steve, tell us about <laughs> tell us about Refugee. So, so Refugee are a, a charity based in Glasgow, and um, what they do is um, they, they they produce sort of welcome packs and uh, and provide support to um, people arriving in Glasgow, particularly, but also the west of Scotland um, and all over Scotland as well. Um, to you know, it, it's kind of a twofold thing. When you arrive from from, from a, a, a war zone uh, or wherever you're escaping from, you, you often only have the clothes on your back, um, uh, if, if that in some cases. Mm. So what refugees do is they provide um, support and, 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 and uh, clothing and, you know, um, uh, baby uh baby stuff for for, for people who have, have arrived from, from these places but also part of the kind of message is that they they, they want to integrate um people who have arrived in glasgow as as members of the community mm. and they're, they're all we're all for somewhere is is kind of the underpinning message of that and so uh, if you're if you happen to be in in scotland particularly in glasgow or the west of scotland um they are really encourage people to write a letter for, for the locals essentially it's a, <laughs> a, a a welcome message from someone in scotland from the glasgow area you know welcome we're glad to have you here we we, we really support you. And, and recent actions i'm sure you've talked about in uh, previous episodes in glasgow you know refugee solidarity is part of the the city's city's lifeblood and um, we, see, we see so much about how um the, this collection of islands is getting nastier and nastier and there was a brief moment of uh, a brief moment of like uh, actually no uk government this is this is what glasgow thinks of you um foxtrot oscar and it was a beautiful <laughs> moment of people just out and just make it it, it was a, it was a dick move by pretty patel and it was resoundingly uh, booted up the arse um, and it was a really beautiful moment where the whole community just came out, you know, hundreds of people just came out to support these people who are trying to get basically the, the home office that needs to be abolished, by the way, um, wanting to just drag away. Uh, and it was, it was a really beautiful moment. And so, yeah, I think this, this charity really nicely captures that spirit, I think. Yeah, and, and these these guys are, are, are great. Are, are, I, I you know I play in a band and we've done gigs to support them. They're uh, really excellent people, and 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 the the, the sort of stuff that they do in, to 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 help people who have moved here, you know, don't speak very much English, you know, to try and uh, get them culturally embedded in Scotland and, and what Scotland is about, and and how how um, you know particularly Glasgow, uh, the sort of you know become a 
a member of the community and, and embrace them as as such and i think it's a it's a really worthwhile cause and if you've got uh Got, got the sufficient funds and you, you're willing to part with them. They're always willing for donations. If you're in Glasgow or the west of Scotland um, and you've got stuff you would like to donate, check the website. There's loads of stuff on there that they're always in constant need of. Or if simply you've got a bit of time, you can just write a letter of support just saying, hey, welcome to Glasgow. Um, it rains a lot, but it's pretty nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah it's 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 really it's really it's really lovely thanks thanks steve that's um that's a really that's a really good plug um ref Uigi, everyone uh, next week's episode which for us is in wait how many weeks three weeks oh that's this is confusing i'm not very good at multiple timelines conflicting timelines uh they confuse me anyway so we had this was episode 69 uh nice uh next nice. is episode 70 uh, and we're we've talked of speed and the things that, that that are important about speed. We're kind of moving on to another um, theme uh, or or railway myth that comes up a lot, which is the idea that uh, reopening the Great Central is a, is an alternative to HS2. So we're going to respond to that by saying reopening the Great Central is no alternative to HS2. That shall be the episode, which will be fun. It's just me basically uh, grumbling and moaning, but hopefully talking some inter- you know describing some interesting things related to speeds and curvature and uh, and timetables and steam trains and it should tick all the boxes for everyone and we can all it, it might well there's a good chance it can be a short one which this one has now not been by 20 minutes and uh and also you can all get involved in the chat because it'll be a live one as well which is nice um which means i can come back to to giant faces steve and i's giant <laughs> faces can return uh kind of medium-sized face steve thanks for that that's just been such a fun episode i've enjoyed that a lot um, thanks, we've Tell covered me. so much nerdy stuff People love the nerdy episodes, though, so it's great. Yeah, and uh, you, you know, I, I, I am in the Discord. If you want to ask me signaling questions, feel free to fire them on there. So, yeah, secondary plug. Uh, please nice. like and subscribe. I've always wanted to say it, so I'm going to do it. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Everyone tells me off for not doing it. You're doing it. Tell, that's it. Please like and subscribe. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> I like it. Um, yeah, Discord Discord server is actually a really fun place because it's full of it is full of technical people and technical discussions happen. And if you're in the industry and you have questions, you can come in there. Um, if you know, there's there's a really good safety space that talks about safety things. That, that we've got, uh, you know, there's a career space which I'm really proud of because actually some good stuff pops up in there and people have chats about you know, can you help my you know, can what do you think I should put on on this bit of my CV and or X and Y. So um yeah and, and also job things go in there as well people occasionally if they know there's a job coming on their team they will drop it in there so it's actually a really good space to be if you're in in the industry or industry adjacent as well as just if you're a nerd and want to kind of get involved but it's a, yeah I, that's not. <laughs> I, I love the Discord server I, it, I'd never imagined it would get as it'd be as wholesome as it is there's 540 people in there I think now and it's like no one's mean or horrible like it's just nice all the time. I think we've like I think we've like blocked perma banned like three people or something in total. It's quite remarkable. Um, yeah, it's lovely. Um, Steve, thank you so much. It's it, a uh, pleasure. Thanks for having me. It's no, the pleasure is all mine. It only remains for me to say thanks. Thanks everyone for uh, for watching. And um, from from Steve and me, uh, I need to get better at trying to do the two Ronnies gag, but I'll never manage it. But anyway, from from both of us, uh, just just really to say cheerio, cheerio everyone, cheerio. Bye everyone.